coming this summer. What the? An instant message from paranormal blogger Tina Cena. What's she doing contacting me at this late hour? Just when you think you've heard everything. I'm not Tina Cena. Not at all. <laughs> well, you're tight like her. Like a girl. Just when you think ufology can't get any dumber. What shall I call you then? Hmm? You can call me the Enforcinator. Hybrids. The movie. Hello? Tina, it's me. Oh, God. Yeah. Hi. Listen, dollface, I don't want to say too much over the phone. You know I don't like the phone unless it's to hypnotize You call people. me every five seconds. Why else would you not want to tell me over the phone? You tell me everything else. You tell me about your bowel movement. What are you talking about? If you like conflict. I'm sorry, Tina. Can we just not do this right now? Hmm? And can we not do the restraining order anymore? Jeremy, I told you, if you were in my bushes again, I was going to get a restraining order. You did not listen to me. Now, what is this enforcer thing now? Come on, come on, spit it out. If you like intrigue. Oh, the enforcinator told me. He told me everything, babe, from your instant messenger. I didn't send you any IM about any... Don't even try to pretend you're not under his spell. He told me all about... How in order for the greys to save their dying race, they need to create hybrids from humans. But in order to get from where they are to here, they gotta go through a wormhole that travels through the fourth density, which is reptilian territory. And all reptilians want, in exchange for use of the wormhole, is to rape our white women. So the greys cut a deal, babe. Yeah, doll. Yeah, face. What? Okay, I sent you a script idea about hybrids and white women, but I did not send you any crazy IMs from an enforcer. If you love deals gone so wrong, they're right. Mind you, you're, this is being recorded because I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to send this to... You're recording this? Yes, I'm recording us. Ah, oh, babe! Can you send me a copy? If you have a hankering for the fucking improbable... Jeremy, you're on probation! <laughs> Coming back from five, you're getting sleepy. Four... We're using our quiet voice. Three, we're using our two ears for listening. And one, we're using our mouth for breathing. Breathing like a fox. Okay, babe, look here. I don't know anything about the Enforcinator. I don't know anything about greys and reptilians and raping white women. So if whoever's probing your mind starts asking about me, you tell him I don't know anything about anything ever. And when you wake up, I want you to send me your underwear. Oh, Oh my god. Wait, 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 Tina, I think you got this all wrong. I just need your underwear to do a rigorous sniff test involving choking off my junk with a zip tie and wearing them like a lucha libre. Then you and me can go hide in Hawaii. I told you I didn't want to do this over the phone. <laughs> Hybrids. The movie. If you think this trailer gave away the whole thing, you've only heard the beginning. Middle and end. This film is not yet rated. Ugh, movies sure do suck nowadays. I bet that thing's in 3D, too. Let's see who's up today on the loneliest podcast of them all. Sure wish Jeff were here. But, guess we can't all get what we wish for, can we? Can we, Paratopia? Let's see, George Han- Ooh, George Hansen. George Hansen. If you want to know all about George Hansen, you can go to www tricksterbook.com or you can just listen to the podcast that's about to happen right now and this won't be a normal george hansen interview because he's actually giving us an exclusive that's right folks we're going to be talking about charisma and the elimination of magic from the world what does that mean well we're going to find out anon and then we're going to do something that should have been done a long, long time ago and give um, skeptical organizations the expose that they so need and deserve. And I don't know, my, my secret hope is that uh, the next time uh, a ufologist or any paranormal researcher is on something like Larry King with these guys, they'll bust out the, I'm sorry, skeptic, aren't you part of a cult card? But we'll see. We'll see how it all goes down. Here it is. The one, the only, George Hansen. Paratopia, without further ado, please welcome to the program, the one, the only, George Hansen. George, thank you for coming back to the show. 
Well, it's always fun to talk with you. And you as well. Um, now, this is interesting. You're, you're giving us an exclusive here on this uh, paper that you've written called uh, Rationalization, Secularization, and the Paranormal, or the quote-unquote Elimination of Magic from the World. I read through this. I wrote down a bunch of questions. I- I'm almost tempted to just let you go. <laughs> like, I almost feel like these <laughs> questions might be superfluous. Once we start uh, well, w- w- let's chat. I'm going to be presenting this paper at the Academy of Spirituality and Paranormal Studies Conference in June. That's out in Pennsylvania. So I've been working on it for about six months. The topic itself uh, has been, it flows out of my book, The Trickster and the Paranormal. And one of the things I've been wondering about for a very long time is why, when so many people are so interested in the paranormal, why is there so little serious research done? Why are people looked down upon who are involved in this? And you would think in religion, people involved with religion would would have a real interest. For instance, spiritualism and mediumship, uh, near-death experiences, all point to the religious idea of life after death. But churches don't seem to be very interested in that. So that's one of the things I tried to address in this paper. And the, the terms rationalization and secularization are not all that well-known, rationalization especially. Uh, but secularization refers to the decline of religion, its retreat from the public square, of the lessening influence of religion, lessening of church attendance. And for the last hundred years, a lot of sociologists were predicting the death of religion. You know, it was just going to dry up and blow away. So that says something very fundamental about sociology, because certainly with the resurgence of uh, Islamic fundamentalism, the growth of the Christian right, and the growth of evangelical Christianity throughout Latin America, we see we see religion is very, very healthy today. Uh, we don't see the secularization trend. So sociologists have missed something very important. But what do we mean by religion? Well, one of the things that many sociologists say, is religion involves belief in the supernatural. And, of course, a lot of academics don't believe in supernatural powers, and some of them try to deny that the paranormal has anything to do with the supernatural. I've had good friends who are academics who who told me that. But if you go to Webster's Dictionary, the paranormal and the supernatural are essentially identical. So the paranormal has massive implications for religion. Mm -hmm. People have believed and witnessed these phenomena for thousands and thousands of years. They're not new. Yet a lot of people poo-poo them. So what I'm trying to describe here is this whole process of rationalization and secularization. Now, secularization is part of a much, much broader process. And... The term was really introduced by a guy named Max Weber. It's spelled like Weber, W-E-B-E-R, but it's pronounced Weber. He was German. And he is one of the most eminent sociologists of all time. He died in 1920. But his probably most his most famous book is The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism. And that was written 1904-1905, first published then. And it's been translated, and it has had enormous impact on sociology and religion and the humanities. It is continually debated. There are literally hundreds of books written about Weber and his ideas. He is a major, major figure. One of the most interesting things, though, that sociologists and others never mention is he wrote a book, The Sociology of Religion, and on page two of that book, he talks about weather control, telepathy, divination. And he uses those kinds of words right there, page two. And he talks about those uh, abilities as properties of charisma. And charisma which in pure charisma involves the powers to do those kinds of things. And this is very, very central to some of his theoretical ideas. 
And in fact, the translators of his books come out and say, yes, this is extremely important to Weber's theory. And Weber's theory has had massive uh, influence in the social sciences. Uh So we start right off. He starts right off talking about paranormal or supernatural abilities. And if you read almost any sociology book, they never mention that. It is totally neglected. Unless you go back and read Weber directly, you, uh, you will not know that that is central and very, very important to his theories. Do you think that that is uh, just an oversight of some sort, or do you read more? No, 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 no. This, this actually fits with his theory, because one of the, in, in his book, The Protestant Ethic and Spirit of Capitalism, I will read a couple, one line here, that great historic process in the development of religions, comma, the elimination of magic from the world. So he is talking about a millennial long, you know, thousands and thousands of years, actually, process where magic and these powers are slowly pushed aside. They are marginalized. They're downgraded. People who are involved in them are looked down upon. And and I've gone to some of the academic journals, and there have been some recent academic journals started to discuss magic, and I've been reading some of those articles. And most of those scholars are unaware of these kinds of issues. They say, no, it happened with the Protestant Reformation. But in fact, this, the attempt to eliminate magic from the world goes back thousands of years. One of the most insightful studies of uh, this was done by a guy named Michael Winkleman, and he and I happened to uh, be students out at the University of California at Irvine together back in the, uh, in the mid to late 70s. And Winkleman actually went out in the field and carried out parapsychology experiments. But he was more, he's much better known as an anthropologist, and he was associated with, the, at, uh, with Arizona State University for quite a few years. And he wrote a very interesting monograph titled Shamans, Priests, and Witches. And what he did, he looked at the roles of what he called magical religious practitioners, things like shamans, witches, mediums, priests, and the like. And what he and he took a big sample of I think like forty seven different cultures and started reading and collecting data on them and going to certain databases. And what he found was that in hunter gatherer societies there were people called shamans. And shamans were very highly regarded. They were very important people in their society and they did things like divination and healing and things like astral projection. Uh, they, would, they were cures. Uh, they were very central to the society, and they also often engaged in altered states of consciousness. They might go into trance, for instance, and communicate with spirits. That was in hunter-gatherer societies. But as cultures changed and became more agricultural, more stable and sedentary, uh, the role of the shaman split into two functions. One was the priest, and the other was the medium. And priests, unlike the shamans, did not undergo into altered states of consciousness, and they didn't command spirits. Uh, what they did, they might make offerings, might make sacrifices, they would propitiate the gods or spirits, but they did not command gods or spirits. The well, shamans... Mean- uh, what, Go ahead. How, where, how would you categorize deep prayer? Uh, that would be that certainly a prayer would not be commanding spirits or commanding powers. Well, not that commanding, would be, but going into an altered state of consciousness, as it would clearing be clearing the mind, almost like a meditation. Yeah, down to the yeah. one thing you're praying for is that. Yes. Yeah. So this is this is a bit like mediumship. Uh, me, let, let's go. Let me talk about mediums, then we'll talk about mystics and altered states. Sure. So, uh, what we have is the priests, but the other uh, aspect of the shaman that was uh, manifested in uh, agricultural societies was the medium. And the medium would go into trance and communicate with spirits, may, uh, may not command spirits necessarily, but would try to do divination and the like. 
Priests were generally nearly always male, and they had high status. Mediums were are almost are generally women. They're looked down upon. They're not. They're typically unpaid for their services. They may do healings, but they're generally low status people. They're and looked upon as maybe a bit crazy. Whereas priests were were and are uh, pretty highly regarded. Now, there are other aspects of the magical religious practitioners, for instance, the mystics. And the mystics uh, would try to become one with God. They would spend, and still do, spend hours a day in altered states of consciousness and deep meditation and prayer and the like. And it is among mystics that we find some of the most dramatic uh, paranormal phenomena ever reported. Levitations, for instance and dramatic healings. So, but mystics themselves are, may go into monasteries or convents, so they're set aside from the everyday world. They are marginal. Mystics and monastics generally are not much part of the ecclesiastical hierarchy. They're off on the side. So they too are sort of marginalized. But yet, that's where we find the most Im- impressive manifestations of paranormal or supernatural power. So we see in religion, religion is not terribly open. They, some religions will acknowledge these powers and kind of put them aside. Others will not. But this whole process of rationalization is continued through the centuries. And one of the most dramatic uh, manifestations of this rational approach was the Protestant Reformation. And you know, there were really good reasons that the, the, the Reformation occurred, but it also had major implications for our understanding of the supernatural. For instance, there, there was a, a doctrine uh, start, uh, promoted called the cessation of the charismata or charismata, several pronunciations of that word. And that doctrine said that miracles stopped at the time of the apostles. They no longer occur. But if they do sort of occur, well, they must be demonic. So there we see, and not all Protestant denominations accept the, the uh, cessation of the charismata, but a fair fair number of do. fair number do. Also, uh, the whole notion of a priesthood is primarily a Catholic and Orthodox idea, also uh, Anglican, but most Protestant denominations have ministers. It's a very different function than a priest. Uh, Catholicism still has a celibate clergy. Again, that puts the clergy apart from the everyday uh, mundane world, and it does put them in closer touch with paranormal or supernatural powers simply because of that position. And I go into that much more in my book, and I think we talked a little bit about that before. Mm -hmm. So what we see is a downplaying of the paranormal or supernatural within Protestant Christianity compared to Catholicism. So, And that was a major uh, impact on the culture at large. So it became more rational. On the other hand, the cost was the uh, loss of, of much activity in the supernatural. So anyway, those are some of the kinds of trends that we see if we look at these phenomena historically. Magicians, people who, and I'm talking about people who manipulate paranormal or supernatural power. Not the gay magicians. Well, some of them may be gay, oh. uh, but well, I'm not talking about performance magic, you know, the sleight of hand, although there's a very a deep relationship there. But magic for in Roman times, some of it was permitted, but some of it was outlawed. Uh, and even today, the Catholic Church says people are not supposed to engage in clairvoyance or even psychic healing. Uh, and that's right in the catechism of the Catholic Church. So the odd thing is, though, they do acknowledge, the Catholic catechism does acknowledge that, yes, the saints and prophets may do healings and may uh, foretell the future, but the ordinary... Uh, a member of uh, 
of Catholicism isn't supposed to try to do that. Right. So there's a real ambivalence there. And a person doesn't become a saint until well after they're dead. Let me ask you this. Um, you say in here rationalization involves disenchantment, i.e. the elimination of magic from the world. And so, and that's what we're talking about here. Does it have to? Does it have to go that way? Or can they coexist? Uh, no. Uh, in Weber's theory, it has to happen. That is the nature of it. And I have... I, I, I'm very impressed with Weber's theory. The more I, I look at the phenomena and the more I am involved in these uh, fields, and I have been involved for over three decades now, it really holds up. This theory really works. Uh, if you look at our major institutions, government, industry, academe, and religion, you don't find psychic practitioners there almost any place. You know, you don't go into a government uh, office or a corporation uh, or an educational institution and find psychics working as psychics. You just don't. You find them, a few of them, maybe on, on a storefront, most of them work out of their homes. You don't see them integrated at all. Even the Army's, uh, the government psychic spying program was on an Army base uh, in a very dilapidated old building. It wasn't part of the mainstream at all. So when I have uh, a man like Teokas and Ghost Horse on, as I did uh, what will be two weeks ago now uh, when this airs, um, he's Lakota and he is trying to speak to the rational Western mind and trying to say, look, there's this whole indigenous mind that, well, isn't mind at all. It comes from the heart. We come from the heart. We don't come from the brain, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, is, is that sort of his mind compatible with our mind? Should he even be trying to talk to us about indigenous thought, or is that just going to always go over our heads or be laughable to us? Well, I think for many people it's going to go over their heads. But there are people who are going to be open to it, and I think these phenomena are important. They've always been with us. Uh, I think they can be used for considerable good. Uh, the saints for, uh, generally displayed uh, paranormal or supernatural powers uh, for the good. But there is a danger. These phenomena and powers do have side effects. But no, I, I applaud him for doing it. But he is from a marginal culture. By definition, the American Indians have not been treated very well. They do have an understanding of these uh, phenomena, and some of the be the most the deepest insights uh, that I found in the scholarly literature have come from black scholars and American Indian scholars. Uh, and you will find some women. Uh, I found a number of women who do too, but almost I have almost never found many. There are very, with very few exceptions, they're blacks, Indians, or women. The old white men in, in academe do not seem to comprehend the major theoretical issues here at all. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I make that point in my book. Uh, it's very rare. I, I want to ask you this, too. Um, you say in here, and we, you know, this is sort of what we've also been talking about here, any comprehensive and effective theory of the paranormal must explicitly address the continued marginality of these phenom phenomena, as well as the scientific research into them. Why does it have to have all three things, the actual study of the phenomena itself plus, you know, those two things in order for it to be comprehensive and effective within the theory of the paranormal? Well, yeah, overall, if, if you're looking at what happens with paranormal phenomena, it's marginalized all the time. You don't find it in, acad in the academic world. If you are going to explain the phenomenon, you have to explain some of its most recurrent and repeatable uh, manifestations. And those include the, the continually being pushed out of the mainstream. It's just not found there. So if your theory is going to be effective, that is one of its most profound and pervasive uh, properties and manifestations. A theory has to explain some of the largest and most uh, consistent effects that we see. Is there any other field of study that does this where you, just by observing or acknowledging 
the paranormal, uh, you are now involved in, you're in, within the field of the paranormal and subject to its whims, <laughs> uh, its uh, trickster nature. Uh, is there anything else that's like that? I'm not sure there is. I haven't thought about it too much. And, and even thinking about it and being involved with it, you know, there's, there's gradations. Uh, now, for academics, it's typically a lot safer to discuss belief or take polls or surveys about belief in the phenomena or speculate about uh, why people believe, but to actually try to engage the phenomena to make it occur, to make it appear. That is really uh, something that's almost taboo in academe. And that's very surprising because science typically tries to go out and do experiments with phenomena, tries to make it occur. That's how physics advanced. That's how chemistry advanced. But with the paranormal, uh, that doesn't seem to happen it's much more acceptable to keep it at a distance. You know, you might take a few case reports, but to go out and try to engage it and make it appear yourself, to test it and see what's happening, that is generally not uh, very well tolerated. So what have you done in your life to avoid the trickster elements of this? Well, I'm not sure I have avoided it (laughs) completely. I'm definitely a marginal figure in many ways. Uh, and I'm not complaining about that. Not in my but heart, I, George. <laughs> but uh, to my way of thinking, the people who are outsiders uh, are probably more in touch with the phenomena, uh, probably have a better understanding of it. And the people who are lusting after academic uh, credentials and respectability probably don't... Uh, encounter the phenomena very much. In fact, if you look at the, the Kessler Chair of Parapsychology, Robert Morris held that chair for, I think, 18, 20 years over in Edinburgh, Scotland. And he, he had well over 20 graduate students who earned PhDs under him. And many of those went on to uh, take positions uh, in academe in the UK and other places. And we see very little productive research from that group. It's a surprisingly large number of students that he had. But if you look at the journals, their output is pretty pitiful. Uh, And nearly all of them really do want academic respectability. And to obtain that, they avoid presenting strong data or even uh, may not even be able to produce uh, some impressive data in in laboratory conditions. Hmm. Um, We'd said before that uh, rationalization can't uh, coexist, I guess, what, at the charismatic level? Um, Yeah, with with, with pure charisma. Yeah, uh, bureaucracy and hierarchy go together. Uh, Now, there's, there's... a variety of understandings of charisma, and there's various gradations of it. Uh, Bill uh, Clinton, for instance, had a certain charisma. Uh, Barack Obama, maybe a little bit less. Ronald Reagan certainly had some. Uh, you get stronger. Uh, probably Hitler probably really had some. Uh, I, uh, and certainly Osama bin Laden has it among uh, some groups. But the pure charisma, the miracle working, uh, the divination, the weather control that Weber talks about is very uh, Francis. He and in fact Weber talked about Francis of Assisi as a real exemplar of pure charisma, and the birds would flock to Francis. He would levitate. Uh, there were a number of miracles, quite a number of miracles uh, reported uh, from, about Saint Francis. But Saint Fra- the, the Franciscan order really wasn't established by Francis himself. Uh, Saint Bonaventure came along, and he was able to institutionalize it much more effectively than Saint Francis did. Of course, Bonaventure didn't have nearly the charisma that Francis did. So, uh, in fact, the church hierarchy was kind of pulling its hair out because uh, Saint Francis had a number of followers, and how they're going to take care of those people, and they didn't want to work, and. Uh, it was, uh, they were not all that well regarded. 
And people who have a lot of charisma are probably going to chafe under the restrictions of the bureaucratic mindset. You just those two things don't go together well. Entrepreneurs are probably a little bit more charismatic than uh, people who uh, work in uh, large corporations. So, yeah, those things don't go together well, especially with their charisma. Mm -hmm. Bureaucracy is a consequence. That's what happens with rationalization. Things become more bureaucratized. Well, one of the things that we're we're talking about on our message board because of this Teokas and Ghost Horse interview is hierarchical thinking. He was saying that that English, essentially, or maybe just Western languages, uh, but specifically English, it's a hierarchical and patriarchal language that um, that they don't. You know, for instance, the Lakota don't have in their language anything for better than. You know, there's no sort of judgment like better than, worse than. Uh, there's nothing for domination. There's no real sense of property in the way that we use it. Um, does that play into? Oh, very this? much. I, I, I'm not very uh, familiar with that, but that sounds wonderful, and it would play in very, very well with these ideas. I'll have to take a look at that in more depth. Yeah, it's uh, funny because people don't seem to understand what he's saying. I mean, they keep debating, and it's so it's weird. I, and I'm just wondering if they can't get it because they're so smart and rational, but maybe it's rational smart, and it's not well, exactly exactly. It's a way of thinking, yeah. and you know. It takes me a little while to get back into thinking through my trickster theory and understanding this because I'm out in the workaday world and these things seem very foreign. And I know uh, the vast majority of people in parapsychology, I am quite sure, have no comprehension of what I am talking about. Mm -hmm. Uh, So it's not a surprise. People who are very, very bright in the rational, logical mindset probably don't get this. And, in fact, uh, my theory even predicts that. And in in the paper we're talking about that I wrote, uh, I looked at uh, people who are very high status in the sciences. And the higher higher the status, the less acceptance one finds of these uh, paranormal and supernatural claims. Just again, getting back to Teokas and Ghost Horse, here's a man whose native tongue is that other language that the rationalists can't hear, but he also speaks the rationalist language very well, and he understands it. So, I mean, does one transcend the other? And if so, is there anything in your study that says why we got away from what is a, a wholer version of thought, one that can comprehend both rational and non-rational? Well, why, why I we think, get away from that? Are we dumber? <laughs> uh, well, in some ways we're dumber. In some ways we're – I don't think people understand how – influenced they are by their own culture. And our culture is very rationalized, and we're part of it, and we're swimming in it every day. It's like the fish, does he realize there's really water out there? Is that just natural part of the world? But our culture, uh, we just kind of go along with uh, how other people think, and we're not aware of that. And when we find someone who thinks very differently, well, most people kind of recoil and step back a little bit and try to avoid that. But we sort of need this kind of rational, logical, hierarchical thought because that's how our society works. And if that falls apart, then things tend to fall apart. You know, people are not doing their jobs. If people were not working every day and just, uh, you know, vacationing, well, you could do that for a while, but if everyone did that, uh, you know, who's going to deliver the mail, who will take care of the water and the sewer systems and the electrical power and the groceries at the grocery store, you know, our society wouldn't be very functional uh, if we didn't think the way we were right? and well, the, the way we do. The other. And so I'm, I'm wondering... Do you think it was a misstep, or do you think it was an inevitability? Do you think it's evolution? I mean, what do you attribute that step well, away I, I, to? As, as cultures and societies become larger and more complex, I think it's inevitable. I don't see any other way for culture really to uh, support itself. You have to have hierarchy. You have to have this kind of logical thinking. In smaller hunter-gatherer societies, you don't need it near as much. 
but as societies and societies are becoming more complex all the time. Twenty years ago, I worked on my car frequently, and I like doing it. You know, cars have gotten a lot more complicated. There are very few people now where I live who I see working on their cars. You know, 20 years ago, a lot more people did. Even in computer systems, you know, I used to write my own programs. I almost never do that anymore. The, the computers have gotten a lot more complicated. We have more specialists. There is a greater division of labor. And to communicate the, with those people, we have to have this kind of common type of language and understanding. Uh, the paranormal, supernatural, uh, and charismatic powers don't seem to fit very well with it. Well, do you think that there is another intelligence involved in these powers beyond us? And if so, yeah. okay, so then do you think that if we uh, build our way away from it into rational structures, is it going to feel ignored? Is it going to come after us? Is that what we're seeing? Or is it going to say, please notice me again? I mean, does that factor I think, in? I, 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 this is a, it's a very, very good question. And I think that these phenomena, whatever their cause, will erupt somehow. And it may be at a very unfortunate time. Uh, we may see, for instance, a charismatic leader arise, and people are unaware of those powers and are just sucked in by leaders. Uh, perhaps this uh, happened in Nazi Germany. I think that uh, we have to be aware of these powers and these abilities by people. Uh, they can be, work very good, work for great good, but also for great evil. And to be unaware of them, I think, leads us, leaves us quite vulnerable. Mm -hmm. um, so we've talked a bit about rationalization. Let's talk a little bit about magic, um, because I don't think we actually defined it. And you sort of redefined it or gave it clarity. Why don't you uh, give us your definition of magic? Okay. Of course, there's two definitions. One is the sleight of hand, prestidigitation, uh, and that sort of thing. And... Tonight is not the night to go into the, the connection with that, that the trick magic and paranormal or occult magic. And sociologists have debated it, and I think that some of the clearest writing on magic was like about 100 years ago, and Weber talks about magic directly, that it is the control or manipulation of supernatural powers, maybe the conjuring of spirits or of some kind of uh, life force or some kind of pervasive force in the world. It, it's, he's very clearly talking about a supernatural kind of magic. I mean, he, he's quite clear on that. Today, if you look at the academic uh, books on magic of that sort, they are very, very confusing, and I am quite convinced that many of the the scholars writing on have no glimmer of what the, that word means. But I think it's quite quite simple. That okay, uh, magic involves the use or manipulation or attempted manipulation of paranormal or supernatural power, whether it be spirits or some kind of vital force, life force in in the world. I think that, I, I don't think it's that difficult a concept actually. Uh, no, but this then gets back to uh, the question I had before: Do you see a difference between uh, shamanic altered states of consciousness and psi magic? Oh, well, altered states of consciousness don't necessarily result in psychic phenomena or magical phenomena, but they often facilitate it. So we even see in laboratory-based parapsychology that altered states of consciousness do facilitate uh, extra chance or higher scoring in ESP and PK experiments, or certainly in ESP experiments. So there is a definite relationship. And we've also, uh, the surveys have shown that one of the most common types of ESP experiences is the precognitive dream. Dream is a very, virtually everyone dreams, and that is an altered state of consciousness. It facilitates ESP. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, there's there's a variety of lines of laboratory research and case studies and surveys and the like that show that. Uh, that's been, it's pretty well established within parapsychology that there's a, a clear relationship there. I, here's a question that I can't believe I didn't have before. <laughs> it seems like such an obvious one now. If rationalization um, 
can't exist with this stuff, then what do you make of the um, paranormal researchers who are trying to tie everything in with quantum theories? Well, that's really interesting. I've, I've had a number of friends who have worked in that area, and maybe they'll come up with something. I'm not a physicist, and I really can't speak intelligently about most of that. I wish them well, uh, and certainly there are aspects of quantum theory that seem to defy rationality. And, but there are very vigorous and vehement debates within quantum mechanics about that, and there is some very interesting. There are some very interesting hostilities in quantum mechanics. For instance, very recently, and I even made, uh, tweeted on this, Brian Josephson was disinvited from a physics conference because of his paranormal interests. And this has gotten out on the web quite a lot. Josephson won the Nobel Prize in physics in 1973. He is an extremely eminent physicist. But uh, Someone decided for this a particular conference that no, he couldn't come. He should not be invited. He was invited at first, then they found out he was had this interest in the paranormal and told him not to come. So, so even within physics, you see some very close-minded people. Hmm. Well, this this sort of elitism. I mean, this this gets to something else for me. Uh, we had on um, oh David Roundtree and. Dr. Stephen Rourke, who said um, that, you know, when you're doing this sort of research, uh, paranormal research, you have to walk the walk and talk the talk of the scientist and and speak their language if you're going to have any hope of, of getting them to look at your work. And I guess one question off that is, well, knowing what you're saying here, do we care if they look at your work? Uh, because it seems that science can't coexist with this, right? Well, I don't know. Uh, science, as it's currently practiced, would have considerable difficulty. But science as a method, I think, could coexist with it. But science as it's practiced is very bureaucratic. It's supported often by states or large uh, corporate bureaucracies. So in those types of uh, institutions, you're probably not going to find very much openness to this. But if you're talking about science as a method of exploring and understanding the world, I think science can effectively address these phenomena, but perhaps not within the paradigms that are commonly presumed to be the right ones. Well, here's my question then. With, with the elitism, uh, is that something that is actually, if you were to interview 100 scientists on an individual level, would 99 of them have that sense of elitism? Or... Is it just that there's this perceived institutionalized sort of protocol that we all are following because we think that's the way the guy next to us thinks, but he doesn't? Well, well it, I, I've hung out with scientists and academics for some years, and looking back on it, academe seems to be one of the most status-conscious subcultures I've ever encountered. Uh, and science is part of that. You know, there are gradations. You get a bachelor's and a master's and a Ph.D., and then there are various rankings of schools and programs, numbers of citations. You don't make a whole lot more money if you're more elite, typically. It's all about status. So I think elitism and status is very central to understanding how science is organized today. And that that's the culture, and so people sort of buy into the culture even without realizing it. So, yes, I think that that is naturally how science and academe works. I don't find it quite so much in business. Uh, it, it's still definitely there, but not nearly to the degree uh, in in the academic world, that status really defines who one is. You know, what uni what kind of university are you? At an Ivy League, or you're at a public school, or you are? Or if you're at a junior college, you're practically nothing academically. Uh, 
So, yeah, I think the, the status is very, very important in understanding that subculture. And, but who studies subcultures? It's other ac- academics are the ones who study cultures and carry out sociology. So they are rather generally ill-equipped and ill-prepared to study their, uh, study that. Mm-hmm. So what do you ultimately think is going to be the reconciliation between these two modalities? You mean the rationalization and paranormal, or which? Yeah, rationalization, uh, what, what, rationalization uh, and the paranormal, or rationalization and um, magic. Or oh, okay. it, it seems like it, yeah. it sort of sprung up maybe in the '60s in some way, and then but then it yeah, yeah, it was just completely well, it, know, it, it, self-absorbed, and so didn't work. Well, it worked to some degree, but no, it's always going to be there. These phenomena will arise, and then they will fade out, but. In most cases, the rational approach is going to trump the non-rational. There will be more people and more, much, many more resources devoted to the rational, logical types of endeavors. But it will never completely tr- uh, triumph over the non-rational, irrational, that, or the paranormal or magic. That's always going to be here. People are always... If you look back a thousand thousands of years, it's always been there. See no reason to think it's going to go away completely. Uh, so it's going to be a continual tension. Well, I think you could also make the argument if you're going to include charismatic leaders in there that that in fact the rational is led by uh, magic in some sense. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there there will be leaders who arise now. If you look at their underlings, they're probably going to be uh, much more rational, logical. Uh, uh, I'd take example, Bill Clinton is quite charismatic. Uh, Al Gore is not. Uh, And their thinking processes are rather different from what I read. So there are people who will rise to the top, yes. And there is a certain uh, charisma of office that Weber talks about. So people at the very pinnacle will almost automatically have some charisma associated with them. Uh, let's see, is there anything else in this paper that we haven't covered that, that you wanted to cover? Well, uh, we can veer off into something else if you'd like. Uh, but I, well, I, can, I can continue talking about this. Well, if you'd like. I mean, I, I, the thing that I, I think Jeff wanted to talk about was skeptics, and so I know that that's a big Okay. Oh, well, I talk about right. the skeptics a little bit there. Um and that, the skeptics are very, very interesting because I've now, in my own theorizing, come to recognize there are sort of two categories of skeptic, skeptics. There's the academics and there's the non-academics. Now, academe, uh, people in universities and colleges, uh, there's a very high percentage of skeptics uh, in that subculture. And uh, they're pretty well regarded, you know, within their subculture, and they generally have high status. There is, though, the non-academics. And I, here I can t- talk about, say, the atheists and the secular humanists who are not associated with colleges or universities. Mm-hmm. And I've gone to a number of those groups, and those groups feel very marginalized. You know, they see everyone else being religious, or a lot of people being religious, and they're a pretty small group. Uh, they don't have, like, churches or uh, buildings where they congregate on a weekly basis. Uh, they feel isolated and kind of downtrodden and the like. So on the one hand, you have the academics who feel pretty high status, and the on the skeptics uh, that are non-academic feel kind of low status. So when the people come together... And I've gone to some of the atheist groups, and they applaud when people announce their atheism and the like. Uh, so the, in some sense, the non-academics, uh, skeptics, are in some ways like the paranormal groups. They don't institutionalize very effectively. There are schisms, and they tend to break, or they don't last very well, and they don't produce uh, very many institutions. Well, what do you make of just the, the fact that these skeptic organizations are primarily run by secular humanism, which is uh, was at least considered a cult at one point, uh, yeah. and, and yet they're anti-cult and anti-all of, you know, magic? Right. Now, should they be considered a cult? 
Maybe, but cults generally, and there are various definitions, uh, cults may have a charismatic leader. These skeptics groups don't really have charismatic leaders, and they're really not religious. Um, one of the, my uh, the people I've read a lot is a guy named Rodney Stark, and he has a really interesting article, are all, Must All Religions Be Supernatural? And basically it concludes, yes, the types of groups that are, are very different, the the atheist, secular, humanist groups really are are not religions as such. They are very involved with religious issues, however, but they are not organized and they do not have the same characteristics as religions. Uh, so they are interesting. And many of these groups do indeed have very, very close ties with, sec- the skeptic groups have very, very close ties with secular humanist groups, and often there is an enormous amount of overlap. Now, are they an offshoot of nihilism? Because that's kind of what they seem like to me. Uh, they seem like it. I'm not sure. I'm sure there's some influence there, but I don't see that uh, predominantly, and I'm not sure I really can, can talk about that very conversantly about the philosophy. That sort of escapes me to some degree. But they do adhere to a rational uh, worldview with little acknowledgement of, say, mystery or the unknown. Uh, they seem more comfortable in the, the known. Right, but it's rational to a fault, isn't it? It's rational. It's, yeah, oh, yes. Don't yeah. believe anything because don't believe anything, and so we'll do what we can to prove that you don't have to believe in anything. Well, Whether they do. Be- they, <laughs> they believe in science, for instance. They do have certain beliefs. It's not nihilist in, in that sense. You know, they do believe in the material world and that it is solid and, you know, it repeats itself and it's predictable. So they do have beliefs in that sense, typically. Well, what do you make of people who would who would band together to say uh, none of this is real and make that sort of their life's mission or their well, hobby? I mean, what, what okay, is that? There- well, that's very interesting. Uh, and there are some very interesting, uh, very illuminating uh, writings on that. One suggests that underlying it is sort of a terror or a fear of the numinous, because the numinous or the divine can be, you know, very enlightening and very uplifting. It can also be terrifying. Rudolf Otto wrote the book, The Idea of the Holy. It's one of the classics of religious scholarship. It uh, was first published in 1917, and it's still uh, frequently cited today. And he talks about two aspects of the divine. It's the loving God and the terrifying God. So perhaps some of those people just have a certain sensitivity. Now, most people I know you know, who are religious don't think about religion a whole lot. Uh, whereas the skeptics and the, the atheists, they seem to think about religion a whole lot of the time. Uh, even the new atheists, people like Christopher Hitchens or Richard Dawkins or Sam Harris or Daniel Dennett, I mean, they are very, very engaged with religious issues. Most people who are sort of religious are not nearly that engaged. So it's a ve- they are a very interesting group to analyze. Let me ask you this. What has been the skeptical reaction to your work? Uh, almost none. <laughs> <laughs> that's easy. Uh, but that's true in parapsychology as well. There are very few who have paid any attention. There have been a few. And I do seem to get more of a uh, response from younger people, say, in their 20s, uh, people who are new to the field. Uh, so, And that's pretty much what I expected. I think people, you know, from their mid-30s upward probably are not going to comprehend much of what I say. And, I, you know, I, I realized that even before I wrote the book. I, and, but I have been somewhat gratified with uh, the response of some of the younger people. And I seem to get more of a response uh, overseas than in the U.S. Mm-hmm. Are you going to be writing another book? Uh, well, I'd like to, but I spent, you know, about eight years on the first one. And <laughs> it just takes an enormous amount of time, uh, almost full time, to, to really do it right. So I hope to write more articles. I'd like to write another book. But, uh, uh, you know, i got to make a living, too. I wouldn't know anything about that. Yeah, well, for years, I didn't either. <laughs> I just, you know, worked a little bit freelance here and there. But eventually, you can't live that way forever. 
At least I could. Some people can, but I can't. Uh, Jeff, George, George, Jeff. Hi. Hello, Jeff. George. How are you, sir? I'm doing great. Good to hear you. Ladies and gentlemen, Jeff Ritzman, uh, he heard the word skeptic and he had to join into the conversation. Yes. Hello. <laughs> Uh, uh, so Jeff, we had started talking about, uh, at the end here, skeptics. And I realized, wait a minute, that's your territory. You're going to want to <laughs> be in on this. Yeah. So yeah. feel free to, uh, fire away. Uh, wow. Where do I start? George, did you win any bets when, uh, amazing Randy came out of the closet? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I didn't see it. Where? Really? Oh, did- really? Why did you do that? I put a post up on your on on our message board that said George Hansen's a goddamn genius, <laughs> and um, yeah, it was like uh, about three weeks ago now that uh, oh. he actually came out on his website. <laughs> oh, I have to look at that. Oh, <laughs> not too surprised, <laughs> but uh, oh, very very interesting. Jeff was. It's funny because Jeff was going to and may still I don't know write a giant expose on the skeptic. Um, secular humanist connection right but you've been talking about it all along here it seems so so yeah I, even my art not out there i mean it just well, seems weird that they get away with saying you know we're, we're pretending that they're just in independent people scientists when in fact they're part of this group who put out an, an effort to uh tell people not to believe anything except for yeah, science yeah. Yeah, my uh, article on PSYCOP, which I think came out about 1992, goes into great detail of the overlap between the skeptical movement and the secular humanist and anti-religious uh, groups. It's just, uh, well, you just find one thing after another, after another, after another. The uh, primary skeptic group, uh, which is now called Committee for Skeptical Inquiry, they changed the name from PSYCOP, which is the Committee for the Scientific Investigation of Claims of the Paranormal, to the much shorter CSI. But one of the reasons they did that is to avoid the stigma associated with the word paranormal. But that group, the PSYCOP or CSI, is very heavily enmeshed with another group that espouses secular humanism. Uh, so, and the number of the, there is the sister organization is the Committee for the Scientific Examination of Religion, and that group uh, and CSI have overlap in personnel and office space, and they're headquartered in what's called the Center for Inquiry up in Amherst, New York. They share office space and personnel, fundraising efforts, uh, publicity, and the like. So, they are. The groups are are totally overlapping, and even on the local scene, you will find that uh, often there will be joint meetings of the secular humanist groups and skeptics groups. They might have picnics together and the like. Now, this is nothing new. This goes back to the founding of the skeptics movement, which was founded at a meeting of the American Humanist Association. Uh, and George wasn't uh, or isn't Paul Kurtz intimately involved now in in the? Uh, I mean, he basically started the two largest skeptical organizations. Am I correct in that? But well, he's also uh, the, he's the president for the Council of Secular Humanism, right? I don't know. I know he re- he's no longer the head of CSI anymore, and I'm not mm. certainly he was the editor of uh, the Humanist magazine for some years, right? Uh, I'd have to look and see just where he stands now. He is getting rather elderly, so I suspect he has certainly stepped down. uh, He's not quite as active as he he probably used to be. Uh, But, yeah, he was very, very active in promoting uh, secular humanism worldwide. What do you think the all-encompassing sphere here is when we're talking about these kind of skeptic organizations, which, I mean, to me... Uh, some of them, some parts of them do really good work, I think. Yeah, in, I in agree. In debunking things, and, and there's definitely an, a necessity for them. But then you also have some that seem to uh, just just offer up very little in the way of, of uh, uh, I don't know, explanations that have any kind of solid backing behind them. In other words, it's just something to throw a dissenting view into the pool. Uh, and I've said for years, there seems to be, I mean, they're always calling for 
a psychological evaluation of experiencers or people who see ghost phenomena and all of that. Um, but uh, I, I've been calling for a while. Why don't we do a, a psychological makeup on the skeptics? Because there seems to be some kind of uh, real deep-seated need um, to want to appear to be the smartest person in the room. Um, and I've seen this in countless, endless <laughs> diatribes on the net and in person. That oh, uh, I have it, too. It just seems you know, like they they have to be the one to talk sense to us nutcases. Oh, oh I've encountered that many times. Uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, there have been some studies of skeptics. I don't know if they've been published. I know back in the 80s there was a psychologist down in the Texas area that was giving personality tests to, I think, New Age and Psychic groups and to skeptics groups and finding some very dramatic differences, which is no surprise at all. Uh, uh, So I think think the skeptics are a wonderful opportunity uh, for study. Now, the skeptics, though, um, have realized that they have generated relatively little attention from psychologists and sociologists, and in fact, the Encyclopedia of Unbelief even has an article by a sociologist pointing that out, and I think they're kind of disappointed that they've attracted so little attention. I'm in touch with a guy named uh, Jim Lippard, who has been involved with the Skeptics Group, and he is, I think, going to be undertaking some kind of study of the Skeptics, but he, too, has noticed relatively little uh, scholarly attention given to those people, and I think they're important. I think they have a lot to offer us in understanding of the antagonism and the opposition to these phenomena. And I try to go to uh, skeptics meetings. I try to get down to the Philadelphia group when they talk anything uh, related to the paranormal. And I sometimes get up to the New York area for meetings there. And they're starting to get a bit more active, so I hope to get up there a bit more frequently. George, do you think that some of these people... Um, I know in particular James Magaha, is that his name? That, uh, oh, yeah. Uh-huh. He, he tends to appear quite a bit on television. Uh, and I'm wondering, do you think that somebody like him just tries to act as persnickety and, 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 uh, um, and as elitist as he does? Or do you think that that's just, a, uh, that's just simply his mannerisms? Because you, you seem to run into an awful lot of them that, that will roll their eyes at you or – sit back and get that look on their face, and you know the look I mean. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, that's yes, just like, you know, I'm talking to idiots here, so let me educate you. I mean, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that to me stir- stirs up so much anger for so many people because it's not only what they're saying and the fact that so many of them haven't even rudimentarily studied a case that they're commenting on. Uh, oh, I agree. But, I've met Magaha, yeah. and I have to agree, yes. Yeah, uh, I mean – how do you do? You, do you think that's an on-purpose thing? Do you think that's? Oh no, no! Part? I think that's how they 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 naturally are that way. I don't think they're putting on any act. I think that's who they are. I, I have to that's wonder not- how they're still alive. <laughs> 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 well, I, I kind of enjoy interacting with those people. Oh my uh, God, George, you're a saint. <laughs> uh, no, I, I had a very uh, years ago. I was invited to address uh, the Philip. Philadelphia Association for Critical Thinking. And the month before, there was one of those types of people who gave a uh, lecture on the paranormal. And so I took notes, and I went next month and gave my lecture and explained all the errors that he made and pointed out. Several times he mentioned he was a member of Mensa, and I pointed that out. <laughs> and I also pointed out that he had uh, the last book. He mentioned one book by Robert Fowles, which was first published in 1963, as I recall. And I think that was about the only book he mentioned. I commented that I hoped that his uh, writing on electronics was a little bit more up-to-date. Mm. And I also pointed out that uh, his whole uh, approach and uh, his comments sort of reminded me of C.S. Lewis's comments that the young man who wishes to remain a strong atheist must be very careful in his reading. <laughs> and I said, and I, and then I went on and made a few more comments and suggested that um, 
Uh, perhaps my comments are a bit harsh here, because after all, one should have some sympathy for those people who are enmeshed in cult-like groups that discourage outside reading, mm. uh, which is very clear that the skeptics do discourage reading of the more serious literature in these fields. Right. I mean, do you... Um, I, I, I mean, I, I can name, like, one guy right off the bat, which is Derek Bartholomus, who is a, a member of uh, CFI West. And... Um, he is a wonderful guy. Uh, he and I worked together on um, presenting some of the the anti arguments to the Meyer case uh, together. Oh yeah, uh-huh. and and, um, and and he's a great guy. And is not, um, uh, you know, in conversations with him, I can see that he is genuinely interested in paranormal instances. But it seems like more often than not. I see a lot of skeptics going after. I mean, we could argue very easily that Meyer, the Meyer case, is if essentially shooting fish in a barrel. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Do, do you find that the skeptics really don't go after in any meaningful way the really brass tax case that we, you know, like something like uh, Bentwater's Woodbridge or um, any number of, of good UFO case, the Trent stuff? Um, do, do you find that they gravitate more towards um, the easier to shoot fish? Oh, yeah. And in fact, I find very few skeptics that have any in-depth knowledge at all. Uh, there are very, very few that are worth reading. Uh, hmm. they, they don't do their homework, typically. Uh, hmm. No, Phil Class certainly did. You know, I had hmm. plenty of disagreements with him, but Phil knew a lot of stuff. Right. Uh, Robert Schaefer and James Oberg also, you know, did respectable amount of work. And I like uh, some of Oberg's comments and writings were very, very insightful. Right. But the, the younger groups, no, they don't. Uh, and on the web, there is really no discipline. Uh, you don't really, you can, and they spout off whatever they want. I right. think the much better skepticism and criticism comes internally. Some blogs and uh, internet radio shows have some very good critical thinking out there. Well, do you think the fact uh, that they are so uh, not well studied and well read and still get on Larry King and these shows and are, you know still appear in the media? Do you think that that's because um, they answer for the rational mind um, just what we were talking about before? Which oh, means sure. That all this stuff is is nonsense, and so it doesn't matter what the answer is as long as there's a talking head that sounds like like me telling me yeah. that this is nonsense, I'm fine with it. Yeah, and the media tries to make controversy because that will generate more interest, and it will assuage those the, the minds of those who don't believe that, okay, there is a voice of rationality out there. Uh, so, yeah, the, the media is more entertaining. Like Larry King, that's, that's not terribly serious journalism in most no, cases. No, but my, my point is, I mean, what does it say when... You don't even have to be saying anything rational. You just have to present yourself rationally to okay, well, it's, make it's, it's point a, against the evidence. Well, and it says fine. something about the nature of the phenomena, and it says the phenomena are marginal. That uh, if they did provide a rational, uh, coherent, and uh, in-depth analysis, that would raise the status of the phenomena, and that would give it more attention. And many people might become rather uncomfortable with that mm -hmm. because these are marginal by their nature. In most cases, there are times and periods where they rise in prominence. But in the everyday normal world, these are marginal. So this really makes a lot of sense that these huh. people can come on and do that. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I can totally see that. I mean, I've been, uh, I think ever since we had you on the second time, um, just about everywhere I go, I see prime examples of exactly what you talked about when it comes to, to marginal figures and and the anti-structural uh, things. I, I've been talking about it to a lot of people, and I think a lot more people are starting to get the idea, at least uh, in the stumbling, bumbling way that I can describe it to them. It, it, and, and telling them to listen to the program and then referring them to your book. 
Uh, it takes a while to understand. It really does. And I've yeah. had friends, I have to explain it three or four times, and they start to finally get some of the ideas. Yeah. If you're yeah. living it, you've lived with the phenomena. So you have a better understanding. You're in a much better position to grasp. Oh, yeah, that's what Hansen <laughs> is talking about. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And people who haven't lived it or who haven't, you know, haven't tried to make an effort to be a little bit marginal for a while. And for many people, that's very uncomfortable. They don't get it. Yeah. But people who've had the experiences who are who have been marginalized, they start to see it. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, well, I mean, Jeremy, what do you? Uh... I'm done. I mean, I, we 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 did our piece. <laughs> You're good. Yeah. The skeptic thing is is definitely what I wanted to to hear about, which is. <laughs> Uh, I'm glad I wasn't the only person to notice the secular humanist thing because that's just oh, oh yeah, I, 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 I have, it completely shocked me when I when I came across. It. I'm like, wait a minute, what do you mean? <laughs> you know, really yeah, don't look, don't believe any of this crap. Just believe what we're telling you. <laughs> yes, yeah, it, it's uh, it, the, the connection is really strong, and several people commented on how much time. You know, and when my article on Psychop came out in ni- in the '90s, people commented on just how much. T- space I devoted to it. And it is really strong. Oh. I mean, and it is still a, a very interesting overlap between the, the paranormal skeptics and the uh, secular humanists, atheists. Yeah. Well, and I go what, into this. You know what's ahead. really interesting is there's a, there's, a, there's a whole faction of skeptics out there that, that don't even care about the paranormal stuff. I mean, they're more interested in... Um, Let's say the 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 ex playmate that uh, her son has autism now, but she believes it came from a vaccine, and therefore oh, she's she's spoken yeah. out like in reams about against getting your child vaccinated. Watch the vaccines, and uh, and so this has become a big focal point for a lot of skeptics out there. And uh, the Jenny McCarthy body count, I think, is what they're calling it now. Oh yeah, uh, you know that's that's a whole another area of. Uh, 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 okay, but uh, that, that's recent. Yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, sure. Okay. But what, what's happened, in my view, is with the decline of popular interest in the paranormal, and especially uh, paranormal uh, being studied in academia, and in the 70s and 80s, there were many more professors who had, were teaching courses. But the paranormal has gone much more into the entertainment area, so there's, there's less scientific interest. And if you look at the tone of the Skeptical Inquirer and the articles, they have definitely moved away from paranormal topics simply because there aren't as many out in the culture. So they're going to generate other areas of interest. This is just one. Uh, So I've seen a very noticeable change in the demeanor of skeptics. They have become a bit more moderate and they have broadened their focus. Now, they are at risk of losing their identity if they get too far out of the paranormal. Mm. On the other hand, they don't have quite the enemy out there that they're battling against. Uh, there, are, there are fewer prominent parapsychologists, for instance. There are, many, there are almost no laboratories in this country anymore, and in Britain uh, there are people who have doctoral degrees in universities, but they are relatively inactive. Hmm. Uh, So the skeptics don't have the targets that they once did. Well, George, what is the the Ryan Institute doing anymore? I mean, there's there's still a website out there for it, and I still see names. There's still a website. Uh, They do. uh, It's, I think, a very tenuous situation. They do publish a a journal called the Journal of Parapsychology, which is certainly the best in the field. Now, it's very academic. A lot of statistically based research has been published in that journal. Um, And it is the most tightly refereed journal in the field by far. Hmm. Uh, But uh, they come on hard times. Oh, really? uh, there, there are some people down there trying to do research, but uh, it's not really very viable as it was 20, 30, 40 years ago. Hmm. Wow. That's a shame. Well, as usual, that's that's kind of what you've said on our show before is that, uh, you know, the skeptic organizations will will gain members and gain funding and all of that while the uh, the, the paranormal uh, 
organizations and endeavors tend to struggle to keep membership and struggle to keep funds flowing. Well, well, well yes and no. Now, the skeptics group, the skeptics is largely a popular, uh, not a scientific organization. And mm-hmm. if you were to compare it to, say, something like the Edgar Casey Foundation or the theosophical groups, they're sort roughly at that level. But the Ryan Institute is very tiny in comparison to, say, the ARE, Edgar Casey Foundation, uh, or the skeptics group. But the, the Ryan Research Center strives to do real science, and it is tiny, whereas the uh, CSI, uh, that's the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry, does have a building, has a paid staff, but they're kind of struggling too. It's not like they're really mainstream by any means. Hmm. They have a certain marginal existence as well. Well, what about somebody like Joe Nickel, who, you know, I, I mean, for as much as he touts that he's one of the only paid full time paranormal investigators in the world, um, I mean, what do you think of that guy? I mean, I'm. I've seen him several times on on television programs. I mean, he's largely another talking head to me. But uh, have you ever encountered him? Does he seem? Oh like, yes, yes, you know, we've had uh, interactions and not always friendly. Uh, uh-oh. <laughs> I think when he was, I liked his work when he was much younger. Mm-hmm. Um, I think he's moderated a bit, but he seems to have to write regularly for their magazine, and that's not really conducive to doing good science. Because if you're having to put out books all the time and writing articles all the time, you're not thinking, you're not doing serious long-term research. Most scientists don't put out that many articles a year, whereas he's putting them out probably in almost every issue of Skeptical Inquirer, and he's talking to the media, and he's on TV. Uh, People who do that don't really have time to do much serious uh, investigation. Hmm. And that's uh, his job. That's his position at the uh, CSI. Do you, do you uh, know how he got how he got that job? I mean, well, he what? he'd been yeah. in the field for a long time, and he had been writing books for quite a while. Really? Uh, you know, he does have some reasonable credentials for a position like that. He has been a private investigator, uh, but let's uh, you know sit down and look at it and look at what a normal scientist does, it's not what Joe Nickel does. Normal scientists may do surveys, may do laboratory research, may teach uh, at a university. Nickel doesn't really do that. He's out talking to the media. Huh. He is writing for a popular audience. Scientists write for other scientists. Nickel does not do that. Okay. Huh. Very I think I do have one more question. Uh, we had on Dean Radin last week, and he said um, that it's important for, essentially for someone like him, for a Western rational mind to approach um, indigenous thinking um, and, I guess, guru-type magic in India and, and, all, and all around the world. You know, all of this stuff, it's important because they don't have the entire picture because their picture is is culture bound, um, do you think that that he's blind to his own cultural bias in that, or do you think that it is possible to synthesize from around the world, you know, a giant picture of magic and and um, and come to some objective picture of it through Western style research? Well, I think uh, his own view is quite culture bound. If you if you read his writings, yeah. Uh, he seems to have a fairly narrow perspective. Now, he's done some interesting work, but I think the Western worldview may, in some sense, be much more narrow than the others, than the indigenous cultures. So I don't have too much sympathy for that. Now, I think there is much to be said for looking at other cultures and trying to come to some understanding of them. But I'm not sure our Western worldview is really going to be effective in dealing with it, at least with the current paradigms and understandings that we have. Well, are there certain phenomena that can only exist in individual cultural-bound contexts? Ooh, I'm not sure that that would be the case. Uh, what do you have in mind? So, for instance, you you would have to be you would have to be a Lakota, or you would have to be 
an Indian guru. You'd have to be raised in, in whatever that is, that, that society is. Oh, oh okay. Well, to, to there, are cer- there are certain group phenomena that, yeah, you'd probably have to be a member of the group or somehow initiated for certain kinds of phenomena to occur, and probably some an- understandings, too. Because when you are a member of the group, you start to develop a certain language and a way of speaking that you communicate that outsiders may not grasp. And group phenomena probably are very fundamental to understanding some of these paranormal occurrences. So does this imply that that, that some of these phenomena are local, are to be found in different parts of the globe? Maybe. Maybe. Not sure about that. There, there seems to be a certain, you know, healing is found worldwide, telepathy, a variety of miraculous phenomena. Uh, so I'm skeptical when you don't find something in other cultures that's comparable. Uh, crop circles being a case in point, I am extremely skeptical of that. I think that is nearly all hoaxing. I think it's very... Uh, <laughs> funny hoaxing and in some ways almost brilliant, but I, I don't think that, the, and I have a number of friends who have been over there and sorrowfully come to that same conclusion. Right. Although I think uh, Colin Andrews' answer to that would be, after speaking to the hoaxers, that the hoaxers are also part of what? the trickster phenomena, that, that something is driving them to do it, that they feel it's... No, you know, the, the, the trickster phenomena is working on a bunch of middle-aged, new age baby who are undergoing their midlife crises and being taken advantage of by Gen X and Gen Y having a good laugh. (laughs) And that's where the trickster was operating. I don't think there was anything paranormal there. Well, I'll pass that on to Colin Andrews. (laughs) Yeah, I am. (laughs) The trickster was operating, but, but and having a really good laugh at the uh, new age baby boomers who were divorcing their wives and taking up with uh, English women or or American women, uh, the Brits who were taking up with American women. Yeah, it, it was. There were a lot of trickster manifestations there, but I don't think there was any trickster uh, paranormal activity as far as the creation of the circles. Now, in the lives of the people, yeah, I think something likely was happening. And there were reports of poltergeists and other types of occurrences. And that makes some sense to me. People undergoing major transitions in their lives are likely to encounter paranormal phenomena, or at least much more likely than in in their routine, mundane life. Well, I know that Jeff and I, when we did our show with Colin Andrews, it certainly had this intensity about it. And there were some, you know, for instance, Colin Andrews, he had a bank of computers that all shut down one after the other after I think Jeff had said something that sort of had to do with that. Uh-huh. Uh, and then I experienced what I can only call a miracle healing of some sort, also related with to Pat Delgado. Uh, I mean, it's a, sort of a long convoluted story, but I mean, it all seemed to stem around this show. Jeff had a weird experience after the show. Um, so I don't know that, that gave me. No, I, I wouldn't rule problems. that out. Uh, yeah. I, I've not met Pat Delgado, but I have met Colin Andrews, and there is a certain charisma and energy there. Uh, So it wouldn't surprise me at all that uh, he might have an above-average number of paranormal phenomena occurring in his vicinity. Mm -hmm. Uh, I am not too skeptical of some of those claims, but the trickster may be manifesting in ways (laughs) that he may not be fully recognizing. But, no, I, it wouldn't surprise and, and Colin Andrews, I think, did a lot of traveling. Uh, he was up in front of a lot of people. And certainly uh, he could get really enthusiastic about uh, whatever he was involved with. So, yeah, I, it wouldn't surprise me that he would have some type of psychic abilities and phenomena occurring around him. Okay. Well, George, thank you very much for doing this show yet again and yes. for being uh, such a huge influence on our show and our way of thinking about yes. all of this. Yes. Well, it's great talking with you. We, we, you know, you guys have got to get up here. we got to get together sometimes. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. That. 
And, and uh, you know, I might also say, George, since we're switching gears with this show, I just want to take the opportunity to tell you that I have told many people um, over the course of the year that we've we've had you on the show twice now that I, I think by far you are one of the few people on this planet that has a decent handle on some of this paranormal stuff. Um, so everybody check out uh, George's website, and that is Jeremy. What? www. George, go ahead. What's the rest of that? <laughs> it's tricksterbook.com. Tricksterbook is one word. dot com. Or if you if you Google George Hansen Paranormal or George Hansen Trickster, it'll probably take you there. And there it is. <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. <laughs> You're welcome, Jeremy. Glad I could be of service. Yeah, glad you came in. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Uh, This is Colin Andrews, and you're listening to Paratopia. If you record audio for any purpose, chances are you want it to be heard. You want to attract the largest audience possible who can hear your message. That's where we come in. We're CyberEars.com, a revolutionary Internet service that will host your audio files and help you promote and track its popularity. Considering hosting a podcast to the world, we have all the automated tools to make the process as simple and easy as it can be. No technical mumbo-jumbo to work out. CyberEars.com does all the work for you. You record it. We take care of the rest. So don't delay. Go to CyberEars.com today and register for a free trial account. Upload your audio files and get heard. With CyberEars.com, it's your audio on your terms. Hey, this is Stacy. This is Wes. Be sure to check us out on the Black Fridays podcast. Where we explore the esoteric one conversation at a time. You can check us out at www.theblackfridays.net. It's a little bit freaky. And we will see you there. Paratopia, it's Jeremy Vaney. Uh, The two for 20 sale is still ongoing. You can get my Region 1 DVD and my book and perhaps a delightful surprise gift. All for $20, shipping and handling included, tax included. Um, So just drop me a line at paratopiapodcast at gmail.com and I will hook you up with the 2 for 20 deal. This is not going to go on forever. In fact, it's not going to go on for much longer. So get it while the getting is good. Esoteric research and investigation into the enigmatic. Eerie Radio is a weekly podcast that features interviews with the world's leading paranormal researchers. Download episodes of Eerie Radio from your favorite podcatcher or directly from the show website at www.eerieradio.com. Eerie Radio. Listen. Learn. Laugh. Paratopia, can you believe it? Can you believe we have Jeff Ritzman for the after chat? Oh, you don't have me for that long, asshole. Wait, hold on. <laughs> Let me clear my palate. Oh. So the Jeff. So the Jer. Oh, my God. Feels like old times. Right. Don't get used to it. <laughs> <laughs> I will now relay the story for the audience that I just told you. When I called George Hansen, he said, oh, my God, Jeremy, I was just about, I was just about to write you. And I said, why, George? Didn't we agree to 9 o'clock? Well, yeah, it's 9.01. <laughs> it's 9.01. I love George Hansen. <laughs> He's awesome. Yes. Awesome. Love him. And I do. I do. So I honestly believe that this is a guy who, you know, uh, has one of the, the better handles on the paranormal. I really believe that. I mean, he... he uh, the 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 whole trickster thing. Put all that aside just for a second, and look at just the marginality and anti-structure topics that he talks about. And you can pick this stuff out, people. I mean, it's it's fairly easy to go to a message board and ask somebody who has a haunted house or a UFO sighting the very simple questions. 
what are you doing in your life right now? You might sound a little creepy, <laughs> but Especially I promise if, you. If you lean in like that, definitely. Right. Yeah, don't do this when you do that. Um, I mean, you'll find that, that a lot of these people fit that profile, fit that, uh, or at least their life at the time and the events surrounding it definitely fit a certain profile. And that to me is a major discovery uh, to be had. So definitely go check out his book and, uh, and email George. George loves to communicate. I think he would, uh, I think he would love hearing from people asking questions about all of this stuff, but it totally changed my perception of it all. I'll tell you that for sure. Yeah. Well, I was glad in this episode, uh, in the part that you weren't around for, where we did discuss some of the differences between Atiochus and Ghost Horse and Joe Sixpack. Oh, okay. (laughs) You know, the difference between magical and charismatic thinkers and rationalists. Uh And that these are two mindsets that ne'er the twain shall meet. Um, And I'm actually glad I asked him about, I I had asked him about Dean Radin, um, because... I'm sure that that will come up because I think Dean Radin said a lot of the same things that Teox and Ghost Horse said. Mm-hmm. Um, and a lot of the, you know, the people who, who didn't get what Teox said are Dean Radin fans. And so I suspect that they will, by this point, here's my prediction, Jeff, because we've done, we, we're, we're taping this now before uh, the Dean Radin thing airs. All right. My prediction is that what they will latch on to with the Dean Radin uh, show is where he says um, it's important for Westerners to, uh, or for science, to study these cultures and, and study the, the, the magic and the psi phenomena essentially within them um, mm-hmm. because they can't, to get the full picture, because they can't know the full picture on their own because they're all culture bound. And I think yeah. that will be what people like Sandy on our message board will write about and say, yes, that's, that's exactly why. Teokasin, for instance, you know, is slanted, is wrong, or or whatever. Not not wrong, but is uh, he has a cultural bias, and so I think it's important to hear that. In fact, so does Dean Radin. So does right. the scientific way of thinking uh, that there is no non-cultural bias, and that in fact some of these phenomena may only exist in culture-bound contexts, or perhaps even in certain lands where cultures are built up around them. Uh, right. I mean, these are possibilities. Pretty so, much is impossible to escape, though. I mean, unless you're raised by a pack of wolves, and then well, you right, have... This, you gets know. Into, this gets <laughs> into, you know, is there this, this the, the stereotype or the, the thing we've built up as the scientific, cold, logical, rational uh, thing that we demand everyone achieve? I mean, is that realistic? Is that what any scientist even achieves? I mean, or is it just something no. that we've built up it as a myth? I think it's a myth. Well, it's a. Uh, and so I think it's like, you, a, it's like an undercurrent theme that has to run through things, or or it doesn't seem right. I suppose is is more or less what it boils down to. I, I mean, that's that's kind of like. Well, I mean, you could always say that the public has adopted a scientific bastardology, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, to a certain degree, and expect certain things because they think that's scientific, and therefore that they won't accept anything less. Uh, I don't know, but certainly. I mean, you know how I feel about science. I most times loathe it, but it's it's certainly got its place for uh, for plenty of things. But I, I I don't know. I to a certain point, I understand why science is standoffish on paranormal and esoteric topics. So I can I mean I can certainly understand it. I walked away from it. <laughs> why shouldn't they? I mean, um, but. I don't know. I, the whole the whole thing of the uh, an idea being culture bound, and you, you're 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 roped into a certain subset of facts that have to line up, or it doesn't make sense for you. Um, that's 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 going to be a tough nut for anybody to crack. You know, it, that's going to be a hard thing to overcome in any meaningful way. I think. Well, the thing we got to in this conversation was that maybe it's not possible. It's not possible for. Uh, a rational reductionist to to see f- this other point of view as another point of view. They have to constantly be trying to bring it into the box. I mean, like, what are you saying? And, and nitpicking right. these little points apart and, and all of this. I mean, that's just, from what we discussed, goes with the territory. It, it's like that's what happens 
well, is this where the wise old hermit comes from who lives in a cave for 200 years and doesn't come out? <laughs> I mean, he's not bound by culture, therefore yeah, he's not. he just experiences everything in a raw form, and that's that's where he gains his wisdom from. Yeah, because part of what George had said is that there's no... Um, essentially, hierarchy comes out of the rational, and this is what Tiokasin was trying to say about language, about hierarchical language and rationality and all that, that... I mean, he completely agrees, you know, with what Tioxin was saying. And so there are various peoples in the world uh, who don't function along those lines, yet they completely understand those who do function along those lines, but the people who do function along those lines don't necessarily understand them. Yeah, uh, and, and isn't that reason, amazing? <laughs> yeah, that's amazing, and for some reason, you know, we're supposed to be the smart ones, but that's only because we've set up the hierarchy and put ourselves at the top, you see. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a crazy world. Crazy. So what's been going on on the show? Uh, I haven't been listening. I'm not a fan. You you haven't missed a thing. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, well. Actually, I think they're all tying together at the end here uh, in a way that I didn't expect. So Hmm. mainly because I think Dean Radin, like I said, says a lot of the things that that, um, would agree with what Teok is saying. And I think... George said a lot of things that would agree with what they're saying. So I feel like these shows are building by, by yeah. accident on each other. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so we might come to some sort of understanding about consciousness by the end of the 70 episodes, even if we don't come to an understanding about the paranormal. That's right. Paratopia gaining consciousness in 70 episodes. <laughs> really just the final four. Kind of like oh. lost. Oh, four. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Great. Well, four episodes then. Yeah, your work has been superfluous. The things that I've done in the last four episodes. Right, that's that's stellar, correct. That's right. Stellar podcast. That's right. I can tell by the message board comments. Yeah. <laughs> 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 well, you know. What do you got to go now? Three? Four? Um, what is this? 67, 68. Well, I guess two more after this. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Wowie, wow, wow, wow. Wowie, wow. So, uh... I should say that we did get uh, audio for, yes. from, well, Roundtree and, um... Dr. Rourke. Dr. Rourke. Uh, but we also got one from a listener, and the audio was bad um, by way of, like, a bad wire or mm. something. I mean, it was just all staticky. Uh, so the lesson there is, if you're going to send us audio, please listen to it beyond, say, the first minute um, because the first, I think the first minute or so was okay, and then it just gets awful. Um, mm. So check your audio before you send it to us, or else you've wasted everyone's time. Including your own. <laughs> Including your uh, own. Yeah, but the uh, the Roundtree Rourke episode is going to be really great. Uh, I'm looking forward to that. But yeah, I, I, I mean, I think that that stands to... I mean, I mean, you can go to, what, Best Buy probably and buy a $10 headset mic that will work pretty damn well. Um, and using that and uh, Audacity, you can look on the web for Audacity, and that is a, a free um, recorder slash editor that will actually, with a small patch, will output to an MP3, and if not, will output to a WAV file. So try those. And uh, you can actually keep an eye on your waveform while you're recording. So if you see a big spike in the waveform that wasn't there before, you know you've got some kind of disturbance in your line and you need to kind of work out that kink. But, yeah, we're, we're getting some submissions and we're getting a lot of, uh, a lot of outlines too, which is great. So, uh, you know, those of you who haven't, you know, gotten on the stick yet, let's roll because you only got two more to go. And then we're flipping it off to everybody else. Uh, so let's or, get some more. Or flipping off everybody else. If nobody or flipping it. everybody off, yeah. <laughs> One of the two, it's up to you. But, uh, but yeah, what we've got so far is, is nice stuff. So we'll see what happens. Very nice. So what's been going on in your life since you've retired? Oh, I, don't, I wouldn't say anything slowed down, per se. <laughs> I dropped into a metal band, and I dropped into a classic rock band and so i'm busy with that and um as far as paranormal stuff goes um well had a three or four people walk through the wall the other night that was interesting um (laughs) 
<laughs> same old, same old. Ridiculous. And I think I told you about this on the phone last night that uh, I heard what was probably the most direct in your face uh, noise in this house that I've ever heard. I, uh, I mean, as usual, I fell asleep on the couch ultra early, probably right after dinner, about eight o'clock. I fell asleep on the couch and I cannot sleep on that couch anymore because it kills my back. So the wife woke me up and um, uh, I went in and I, I made some crab soup and it was good Lord. It was probably two thirty. And maybe about 3 o'clock, I was sitting in the chair watching a movie. And um, I'd say during a quiet spot in the movie, I heard somebody, I I mean, uh, I fully expected to look up into the hallway and see someone standing there. It sounded like they walked right out of the guest room where you stay, uh, walked down, you know. Never uh, sleeping there again. (laughs) Oh, come on now. Uh (laughs) Uh, I mean, could hear feet on the carpet, could hear, um, you know, the the walls responding to some kind of sound uh, coming down the hall. And I look up and there's nothing there whatsoever. And off to the right, on the opposite wall from the TV, we have a, a pair of sconces up on the wall and a mirror. And I told Jeremy, but I had a real hard time trying to explain this in a in a visual way. I was looking at the TV and began to see figures that were roughly like silhouettes it seemed to have had a a bit of a hazy, brighter area around them. I won't say glowing because it wasn't glowing, but it was a brighter area around them that seemed to be coming from a distance farther than the wall. So imagine that you can see someone through your wall, but the wall's not transparent and you're seeing them walk towards you uh, more or less like at an angle and they seem to be walking through the front of the house. And once again, if I tried to look at this directly, I didn't see anything. But to look at the television or to look at the back uh, you know, towards the back door or the back of the house it was very obvious that you could see um, what, what seemed to be men with uh, I don't know, suits on it. They seem to have very clear cut, sharp corners on their shoulders. So it reminded me of a business suit type thing. And women with, uh, I saw one woman's figure that clearly had her hair in a bun with a pillbox hat on. And they were just walking in this, this loose group. I mean, I don't, I don't know what to make of that. I don't know what that could, it was very brief, but, uh, but, uh, not slow moving. Um, they were, a decent pace. So it was in the course of maybe five to seven seconds, you could see this group walk by. Uh, I, I don't know what to make of that. I don't know what that could be. Did you, in the old, uh, in the condo, did you have that sort of thing with peripheral vision or is this something new? Uh, no. Uh, peripheral has always played, uh, uh, I'd say a decent part in most of this for me. Um, uh, I know we've talked about, what I guess people would call a shadow person type thing that we would see walking into the bathroom at the condo and in the hallway. Uh, That was direct line of sight. Most times Uh, other times uh, light phenomena of certainly the flashes were not peripheral. We would get flashes like someone taking a photograph of you with a flash cube. They certainly were omnidirectional, um, but yeah, the 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 peripheral has always played um, a part in some things. It, namely, you just see a you you'd notice movement uh, is the best way to put it. You, you, there was no way to tell what it was, but you'd always see some kind of movement in your peripheral at the condo. Always. So it's not uh, like this came about because you'd asked the phenomenon to keep its distance. Uh, no, I would say not. I would say not. Have you uh, seen? Um... I keep wanting to say Smoky Man, <laughs> like from Lost, but oh, the, uh, the guy in the black. Uh, I, I went out um, not not too many days, I guess, after we recorded the show. Uh, my last one, I was outside. It was late. Uh, I actually went to uh, go unplug. We have a fountain in the backyard. And I went to go unplug at the pump because we were due for a storm. 
And my backyard has a, a large slope, and I have uh, a, like a woods beside my house. And um, you know, I saw it looked like a figure, uh, dark, that I was seeing against the trees in the backyard. And I don't know. For a second, I thought, "Is that it? Is that what?" And I and I said, "Is that you?" <laughs> I said it out loud. And uh, you know, my neighbor is probably looking out the window, going, "He's crazy." Um. But uh, it, I didn't hear anything, and it didn't move. Uh, and then as I went to go in the house, very clearly in my right ear, um, almost like someone was very close to me, said, uh, that was the best thing you could have done. That's what I heard. So I don't know what that means. I don't know further. I don't know since then into what you think that was. No, 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 I know. I've thought about that. I don't, I don't know if it was that I didn't walk down into the, down to what I thought was a figure. I'm now kind of more inclined to think that it was the trees silhouetted against the street lamp. That's on down the block, but man, it sure looked like it was somebody standing there. So, I don't know. I I can chalk that one up to just plain weird, but uh, um, I know I was before I went out. The only thing, Wait, what are you if, to I, if I wanted to draw some kind of line, well, I don't know. I mean, what I can chalk it up to, if I want to try to explain what that meant, was that when I first said, "Oh crap, I've got to go unplug the fountain because a storm is coming." I don't want the you know I don't want any kind of electrical short in that. Um, I I actually paused for a second at the door going, I don't know, it's it's towards the three o'clock hour. Do I really want to go outside? And and I just said, to hell with it. And I popped the door open and I went out and I didn't look up and I didn't look around. I I walked into the art studio. I went over to the plug. I unplugged it and I went back outside to make sure it had enough water in it. And And that's when I saw this figure. So was it saying that was the best thing you could have done and just – swallowing the lump in your throat and going out alone at close to 3 a.m. in the dark um, to unplug something that probably would have been okay anyway. I don't know. I mean, maybe that was it. Maybe that was a, maybe that was some kind of mini hurdle. It certainly wasn't that, that hard to do. I'll put it to you that way. It just, I initially felt an apprehension about going outside at all um, alone like that. So, I mean, everybody was asleep. Probably the neighbors were all asleep. So, uh, I mean, my mind always works these days is, you know, how close is the door? (laughs) You know, where can I duck? (laughs) Which is dumb when you really think about it. Um, And I should know by now that if something is going to happen, it's going to happen and there's not a whole hell of a lot you're going to do about it. So um, that's the only line I can draw is that – Maybe something was saying that was the best thing you could have done was to swallow it and just go. But that was it. I, there was nothing else the whole rest of the night. Uh, the only thing uh, past that um, was my wife last night said that she had a very odd, oppressive feeling. Uh, although I did not, uh, I didn't sense that at all. Uh, but we've had a death in the family, so maybe that was part of it, and maybe it was. Uh, 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 I mean, I got some some fairly bad news about a childhood friend on uh, Mother's Day. So we kind of got like a double whammy on Mother's Day. Uh, we found out about a, a death in the family, and and um, and I found out one of my childhood friends is stricken with cancer and is not doing well. So those two things right in a row were kind of wow. You know, bad things can happen to fairly young people. And maybe that was just the, the oppressiveness of knowing we have a viewing coming up that we have to go to that's going to be very hard. So I don't know. That could have all added to her uneasy feeling last night. So maybe that was it. Um, but I don't know. I, I Like I said, nothing, nothing, uh, nothing horribly, hardly in your face other than the people and that certainly that Walking coming down the hallway was very strange stuff. But oh, I took a trip sad. to Gettysburg to do that, and that was uh, that was interesting. I took uh, snake oil on our message board. I took his uh, his coil and uh, recorder 
an amp out there and did some recording at the Nesbitt's house upstairs and downstairs. Um, didn't get anything with the coil there, but did get something out at the uh, cannon emplacement um, behind Devil's Den and in front of Triangle Field, which definitely sounds like an organic voice to me, but I couldn't make out what it said. But it, I might note that it's the only thing that I've that I've gotten with the coil at all. Uh, so it, it held some interest for me. So I'll be going back and taking that with me again. But I'm also trying to amass the equipment that uh, David Roundtree has suggested to get and uh, I'm trying to follow his lead as far as how to set things up, uh, what equipment to get, what, what, you know, what's, what's a good starter, what's a good ex- inexpensive recorder. Uh, so I'm, I'm trying to, uh, to get that together. And I guess while I'm thinking about it, we are going to definitely be doing a trip uh, or two this summer. I think I've mentioned on the show before and possibly on the message board about Point Lookout Lighthouse in Southern Maryland. Yes. Um, I have, uh, I have again sent that, another request no, for No researchers have gone past 3 a.m.? Is that that place? Right. Well, they, you go in, I believe it's at 9, and you have to be out by 2.30 or 3 o'clock. But uh, oh, from what I understand, I it nobody not, made it. No, no, they they actually uh, they actually put you out um, at that point. But I'm trying to get that extended by a little bit so we can definitely be there at the three o'clock hour at least. Maybe make it till four. Um, so I'll be getting details on that probably within the next week or so. And uh, we're good to maybe start getting a list together to go to Mark Nesbitt's house and do an all nighter there. Um, which is a, a treat and a half to go there in that place. So you know uh, keep an ear these? out for an eye. Have you figured out how much these uh, are? Not as of yet. Uh, I, I, I'm reasonably sure that the Point Lookout Lighthouse is going to be uh, around $110 a person. And those, uh, those will be going to essentially restore the lighthouse. The lighthouse right now is in it's a good time to go because it's being restored and uh, that's how they're gathering funds to help with the restoration of the lighthouse. Cause it's a beautiful place. So that's where that money will be going to uh, as far as marks go. I- I'm not sure yet, but, but I'll definitely, uh, I'll be talking to Mark pretty soon and we'll, we'll get a date set and we'll get a price set for that as well. Very good. Very good. Anything else? Nope. Chum? It's been a pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> And I'll see you in a couple of episodes. At the movies. (laughs) Oh, right. Yeah. And we're out.